Yeah. So, yeah. Show the so, book, please. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Malcolm Jacobson. I'm a PhD student in sociology at Stockholm University, uh, and I'm interested in uh, subculture memories. And uh, this study is uh, this book is part of this study. It's called Svensk Old School Graffiti or Swedish. That would be old school graffiti. Uh, it contains photographs of graffiti made in Sweden between 1984 and 1992. Uh, and I have studied the process leading to this book and also uh, the book itself. So I will share my screen um, and tell you more about this. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of windows there. So is it framed now for the presentation? Great. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, so this is a part of my dissertation. Uh, and the theoretic framework and definitions uh, that I use in this study and in the dissertation uh, as a whole uh, are that the subculture is a performance of difference. So the participants uh, construct their meaning uh, through making a difference to what they conceptualize as the mainstream. Uh, and subcultural graffiti uh, here designates practices in the New York subway art tradition. And these are based on the cultural meaning of art and crime. Uh, that's quite kind of simplistic, but you get the idea what type of graffiti it is, I think. And uh, my research interest in, is in subculture aging, since subcultures have been usually understood as youth practices. I'm interested in what happens when uh, the participants are not young anymore. Um, uh, and what I found during these studies is that uh, graffiti writers construct their life courses as different. So memories gets kind of an, another way to, to do this performance of difference in relation to the mainstream. Uh, and I also found that it's mostly men who do this in Sweden, but I think that are I see that in other countries as well, this memory of graffiti writers. So it has gone in like an intersectional direction studying masculinity and age. And the subculture memory work uh, is then a social, the social and cultural meanings of memories. And from this perspective, I use these memories are constructed in the present. So they are not objective representations of what happened in the past. And they are collective rather than individual. And in this study, I look at a case of crowdsourcing uh, and uh, Ridge discussed this, uh, defines crowdsourcing as a practice where participants jointly collect, organize and describe cultural heritage resources. And this usually has been associated with kind of established institutions like museums when they invite like what you might say like ordinary people or, or the public to, to help the historians. Uh, so this is a brief image of the process I have been studying or the practice. So my field I study is uh, the cloud uh, up in the middle, that's the Facebook group. Uh, and uh, it has 1600 members. Most of them are middle-aged men. And in particular, the middle-aged men are the most active. Uh, and then I started this book I showed uh, that's in the middle here. That's, that is a result of the Facebook group, you can say. And also I visited the re release party, which was an occasion where some of the, these participants that either have never met or haven't, or haven't met in a long time, some of them met face to face. So I studied this through ethnography, uh, visual analysis, ethnography and interviews. And my research questions are, how do photographs enable connections between aging graffiti writers? 
how are subculture memories used to construct a shared past? And how are material materialities used to express and experience a shared past? Uh, so I use the critical visual analysis as my main uh, analysis tool here. And Rose suggests uh, four sites where we can study how the meaning of images are made. Uh, and I use two of them, them in particular, circulations where images travel. And you can see this as the arrows here, where these graffiti writers describe how these photos were, were forgotten uh, in these houses uh, that's drawn on the right and left side. So they describe that these photos are in bags and shoe boxes. Uh, so they are like, uh, uh, the, the graffiti writers then engage in a kind of practice to rescue them through uploading them to the cloud here, Facebook, where they get a lot of comments uh, from, from emojis and also questions are posed and they kind of discuss them and, and add knowledge, you can say, and also a lot of uh, appreciation to the photos. So, so this is also then the the site of audiences, audiencing where images encounter its spectators and users. Uh, and then Rose also, also suggests three different mod modalities that are different aspects of each of these four sites, which I then cover two of. So the technological modality is how images travels and are displayed, or at least these are the two technological aspects I look at. Here, that would be Facebook and the book in particular, that the photos are reproduced through different technological means. And then the social modality, that is the social relations, institutions, and practices where images are used. Uh, so what I find then, uh, several aspects I will try to cover here. Uh, the first is then how these photos connect, are connected with each other and how that also connect the writers with each other. And I find that this reconstruct groupness and groupness then is a, a feeling of belonging. Uh, so it's not that the group is, uh, has clear boundaries. The, the group here is more conceptualized as a, as a feeling that you belong. And these, these kind of social bonds that construct groupness here, they are not necessarily existing or the same as they were in the past. So they are rather constructed than reconstructed. And we have an example here from the Facebook page where John Person says or writes, hi, my graph name is Steam. I have no photos from that time. So if you have something, please share them with me. And this is an example where you can see he uses two different names. His Facebook account is his, in his given name, but no, no of the other writers really know who this John person is. So he has to like spell out who he position himself within graffiti uh, and then kind of co construct a bond with other participants. Uh, and uh, when these photos are connected, uh, they construct a shared past through marking similarities and difference, similar, similarities within the subculture and difference to this outside. And one way this is made is that this construct a shared time frame. So that they define the beginning of these, the, the, what they discuss as an era, and that is 1984, which they agree on, most of them. Uh, and then they also define an ending in 1992, where they argue like a, a new kind of style and new, new writers came. But this ending is not definite. They, they kind of discuss, is this the right framework? Uh, so this framework within it, the, the meaning of the old school is constructed, but it's kind of arbitrary. It's like the, it's, it's done in the present, this horizon from which they look back at the youth. And here is another example of this. In this spread, uh, there are five photos from three different cities in different parts of Sweden. 
and this cover almost the whole time frame from 1986 to 1992. So this is an example how they mix these photos together in the book. So the differences between paintings and, and individuals uh, are kind of neglected. So that construct the feeling of, of unity. Uh, both geographic and temporal difference. So, so some of these writers represent, represented here as a unity never met each other or came from different parts of Sweden. And here's another example of this, how during the release party, uh, several of the writers ha have really easy to connect with each other, even if they never met before. Uh, while the other persons around them here, that is their kids and, and the wife to one of them, they are kind of not included. They, they, they don't share this, this uh, meaning of the past. So they can't really enter this like, like time capsule going back. Uh, so that's, that's also a difference to the non-subculture that, that uh, it, it's, it's within the subculture that this, this uh, groupness can, can exist. Uh, and one way this is done is then to, to make the absent present, that what happened in the past is kind of re relived or reactivated now, but it's, as I argued before, it's not like the say, it's not a, a clear representation, it's rather like constructed what it means now. So one aspect of this is absent friends, for example, they discuss people who are not around, somebody who passed away, they make us, they ask like, like Steve asked her here about the rumor that scam is gone. Is it true or is it for task? Everybody who knows. And then other engage in this like, yeah, it, it's, it's true. And then they kind of also share memories of this person. And another aspect is an, that is an absent environment that is made present. So Bjorn Jansson here says, I was thinking when I put the kids to bed, that piece I'm thinking about was probably three letters, light, white, and silver almost. And then others engage in this, discussing which piece it was. Uh, is there a photo of it? And they kind of type, try to make an imaginary picture of the environment that this piece was. So they kind of lay a puzzle to reconstruct uh, their past. And also the practice of youth is, uh, is absent. So Roger Johnson says here, well, that I or we, some in this group would stand and paint illegally again, would be a site for the gods. So they like present the, the practice they did when they were young as, uh, as something uh, that's not possible anymore. That's not necessary for all middle-aged writers, but this is a common way it's presented in this group. And also uh, the youth is uh, made present, uh, the, the absent youth through, through photos of uh, how they looked, for example, what clothes they wear. And you can see like, they look quite different from the image uh, at the release party. So, uh, and they all often express that it's really valuable to have this like photos of people that are quite rare actually they are they, they are much less photos of of people than of, of pieces paintings and then another aspect is the materialization of this shared past that they are constructing uh, and uh, one aspect then is as i showed in the beginning material transformations that the images travel and are technologically transformed. So one of the editors to the book says, uh, or writes when they made this decision, we have, made, we have decided to make a book. It just would be stupid not to document this properly. So this thing about to document it properly is kind of a discussion on what type of materiality these photos should be preserved to. And the, and the printed book, uh, has a much more for this writer value uh, that as they discuss as proper then. And th this is connecting to, to the, how they feel and experience their past. So one of them says about a book or like physical photos, it's a completely different feel to have the photos in physical form uh, is so much more precious than seeing them online, which just like 
in the feed somewhere. So they have this, they express this feeling of the photos kind of disappear online. Uh, but in the book, you can kind of hold them and really experience them in a concrete way. Uh, and then, but interesting when they talk about this is like they cannot really put words to why this is so important. Uh, so they use a lot of emojis in the Facebook group and one of the editors, editors talk about the book and the content. Uh, and he says, the truth about this time could not be reduced to one explanation. Instead, it had to be experienced through photographs that speak for themselves. Uh, and that's also connected to this mix of different photos that is like one, one whole experience rather than dissecting it to understandable analytical parts. They refrain from doing that. So uh, some of my conclusions are then that the crowdsourcing raise claims for that the non-subcultural should recognize that graffiti has a, is a cultural heritage, but they do this while maintaining the subcolor life course as different. So they don't, they don't want to adjust to like the standard view maybe of cultural heritage. So they kind of balance between, especially in the book that is kind of its form speaks to, to people also outside the subculture while, while the Facebook group is more internal. Uh, and this process then sparks social connections uh, and construct groupness, which I, discussed uh, and the pa the past doesn't like preserve or or maintain social bonds in itself what i see here is is it's an active memory work in the present that that construct these bonds they are not already there um, and as i said like the digital social media is very good for these connections but the print on paper enables preservation of the past uh, and immaterial social bonds, these kind of connections and groupness is made material. So you can kind of put it in a bookshelf and own these, this meaning and experiences and kind of keep it close to yourself by having it in your home. So the book becomes a material object uh, that is inseparable from the subcultural community and its participants. So the focus in this process has been transformed from being representations of individual paintings into, into a materialization of, of the writers and their community. Uh, yes, almost 15 minutes. Not really, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Uh, Jomi, uh, uh do it do do your question yeah hi uh, thank you for the in my presentation i enjoy it a lot because it's uh we can we in, in every in every european scene we have the the same the same facts if we think in barcelona or in valencia we have close close facts one one of the most interesting that you say for me is the 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 value of the book as a linking tool between generations, especially in in, in the old school, and and the the value for many writers that pass it away or or lose his participation in the subculture and come again and share photos and maybe one in, in Valencia men, many of them come again to the subculture through releasing a book so maybe 15 old school writers are now painting in Valencia due to in 2009 uh, some researcher made a documentary so they started uh, they started to paint again so it was a really interesting fact. And also, uh, uh, I, I want to point out uh, uh, an interesting fact for me. Yeah, and, and this is a bit controversial because the meaning of old school, because everybody here knows that 
always old school is the first generation of every scene. But mm, what is happening today is new writers of new new scenes, may, maybe writers that has uh, two, three years inside the subculture, think that middle school writers are also school writers, old school writers. So it is, I, I don't know if I, I, I explain well the, is, is the meaning of, of the old school concept because in, in the past of the times we have in Swedish, all Swedish graffiti scene is maybe three, 35 years old. So for many people, for many youngsters, the, the writers from 1993 are true old school writers, but I'm sure that 88 writers don't, don't think the same. So yeah, uh, that's what I tried to say also about this this uh, time frame is a construction. It's arbitrary, uh, but I think what I find both this linkage of generations that you say, and also like that that the kind of old school is extended as far as longer it is away. So when I was a teenager and started with graffiti in 1988, everything before, like then the old school was just three years, 1984 to 1987. But now the old school in this, when they do this book, they kind of established that the Swedish old school ends in 1992. And I think you can see it as in photography, if you have a telescopic lens, everything in the, in the distant becomes compressed. Yeah. So uh, why do you have, why do you have a wide angle lens? The, the distance between things are extended. So it, since they look at the past from the present position and the past is far away, everything is compressed. And then these, uh, these uh, social connections can be established. So as I said, even if they didn't paint together, they are now like uh, feeling that they belong together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Susan, you are next. I know, but I had one. So it's not really a question. It's more of a comment. I really love the, the materiality of memory point you're making. And I, th I think that's it, it's kind of a recursive loop of old school, like to, to have the materiality of the object and the old school object, even though we're quite digital now. Do you think, Malcolm, that like the future old school will still be so attached to the print object and materiality of memory, or do you, you know, do you, do you think we might move in? I'm asking you to speculate. I'm not like an academic. Yeah, so, so I have one theory I think is intriguing that I didn't cover or didn't have space to use, and it's called the Gutenberg parenthesis. So it's the argument that print is just a short period in time in history, since social media is more like verbal communication. This is fluid, not solid, but I think this is a case where you see that, well, it, it, does, it isn't like that. The, the print and the tangible thing is so important. So it will, I would say it will continue. You see the same with, with the records, like the, the vinyl records, it's the same thing. You, you want to hold something and particularly I think when social media is so so dominant, that I think that rather increases this this feeling of having something. I can't wait. In twenty years, we're going to check in and see if you're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, if I could chime in, one of the things that I found early on um, about uh, history and recording history and how graffiti graffiti writers of my generation did it. Um, of course, a lot of it came through black books, but one of the more interesting things for us was when technology kicked in. Um, my brother Kel first and I were the first to bring hip hop and graffiti online. And one of the things that we saw to the benefit of the writer was something that we understood about uh, the train map, right? And how, how the New York City train map it just fans out and stops and stops and stops. And, and those stops means that there's eyes looking at you and, and looking at your work. So technology, the map, we correlated the map of the train to this new concept called the internet. And we were like, damn, this is the biggest layup ever that will ever be. So we have to utilize that, right? Towards the future. And we became techno advocates, especially to teach young graffiti writers about 
um, not just technology, but exactly what you're, you're, you're talking about, about learning how to publish books. Uh, we have people like Stress Magazine come of our, out of our studio, Alan Kett and others that used to come for help. Um, so the advent of technology for the, the graffiti culture was critical, as important as then as it is now, uh, not just in advancing ideas and history, but also how we practice and what we practice. And so while I, I love print and, and print is not dead as of yet, um, the technology has proven to be more indispensable to us. Yes, I think we have several interesting things with what you say. And one is the way with how graffiti writers and, and also other subculture practices use the infrastructure for their own means. So they like first they use the subway, but then they use the internet and they also use print. So they kind of adopt uh, everything, all kind of infrastructure and communications tool for subculture purposes in an autonomous way. It's not like they react to it. It's either that they, they are creative using it. Well, talking about urban creativity, that's kind of what it is. Yeah, it's an urban thing. Also, you know, keep in mind how urban culture pushes technology. I mean, from the cell phone to the beeper out of necessity and, and to communicate in clandestine ways, right? And that's the, that's the kind of genius and the remix of hip hop culture. Uh, it, it takes whatever it can grab its, its hands on and, and remixes it accordingly. Uh, so, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's the, that's the seed of it all, I think. Uh, Jacob, uh, you have your hand raised. So I'll move my question, but I, one thing, I came to think of when this this kind of like, I mean, old school, I guess, is a word uh, and words can have different different meanings uh, in different contexts. And that's something that I think is interesting. But as John said, that uh, some writers are old school 93. And I would say I saw the discussion on this specific forum. I think it was yesterday where somebody claimed that Today, uh, 2000 should also be old school. Um, and so, but I think what you are framing here and what I think you, is what I also uh, have seen in my research is this, that there is a break in the field. And I think where this break is, is different, different places, but we have, I mean, as, as Carlos Mayer said it, I think we've always been uh, part of hip hop and graffiti to be interested uh, in history, but what has happened now is that it's uh, the early, the history was earlier referred to as a part of a prolonged now. Uh, it was earlier phase of what's going on at the moment, but what has happened is that it's actually, people have started to realize that so much has changed that, that it's actually a break. There is a kind of melancholy in the scene in a sense. Um, so it's an epoch, as you said in the beginning, and that is, I guess, old school uh, as an epoch rather than old school as an identity. Uh, I don't know if that's, it was just a reflection on the co joint of Jones. Uh, uh, there's two different definitions of old school at the same time here, and I think they're both legitimate, but they are referring to slightly different things. Uh, so that's, I, it's, we sometimes talk about my disciplines, uh, art history as a discipline made out of melancholy, because <laughs> what we study are usually things that are uh, lost. Uh, yes, uh, I, you know, think, yeah, sorry, can I uh, say something to Jacob? Uh, so I've been thinking about this concept of nostalgia, and I'm a little skeptic mm -hmm. if that's the case, because the meaning of nostalgia is kind of what you say, like the sorrow of something lost, but this perspective I adopt is that it's made present. It's, it's not mm -hmm. lost. It's very alive, these memories. Yeah. And I yeah. also think about this. One of my argument was that as you as like this is really a construction where the break should be. And that's from the present horizon. Mm -hmm. so the past is collectively defined. Mm -hmm. And they are not, as you say, they don't agree. They have to kind of uh, they have to kind of struggle a little before they can decide. 
uh, and KRS-One, I think, wrapped in 19, 1987, 50 years down the line, we will be the old school artist. artist yes, I, th I think it's all yeah. of that specific call. And just to, but it, the, there is this, uh, I think melancholy is, uh, is the good word because it's, it's not nostalgia. Well, perhaps it's also nostalgia and it's a lot of other things, but uh, nostalgia is this kind of, uh, I mean, melancholy is this kind of very special kind of sadness which is a kind of sadness that is, I think, is, is also accepting that something has been gone. But what you say also, one of the Michael Ann Holly, which is a, a psychoanalyst informed art historian, she talks also about the art object as this very special type of, of ontological object in, in a sense, because it's uh, because of its materiality, it's, it's lost and found at the same time. It, it is present but it's also lost. Um, so yeah. in, 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 empirically, I don't see a lot of melancholy. They are really happy when they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let me, let me add to that because there's something interesting about what you both are talking about. Like the melancholy, I understand as, as an old schooler and also as, you know, youth is, as they say, you know, uh, uh, youth is wasted on the young and that those, those, those innocent times when we think about where we are today that we're having a conference right now talking about graffiti. You know how far removed we are from, from, from it, but yet not because this conference was the same kind of conference we had at Writer's Corner, so to speak, right? This is where we gathered to talk. But the other shit is that the melancholy is that the world is moving faster and away from us and what our in original intention was perhaps. But then when you look at the way for me as an old schooler and the way the world responded with people like yourselves after the fact that my goodness, it's this is better than we could have ever imagined. Now, the other thing as an old schooler, I, I kind of cringe when they call me old schooler because I'd like to think of myself ahead of the pack. I'm always thinking ahead of the pack, whether it's technologically, academically, and so on. So for me, I'd like to promote that. Uh, I know my generation, uh, again, I think many of them are stuck on the melancholy. Uh, let's just say Jacob, right? And that's romantic, right? I get that. I think all of us are kind of maybe stuck on that melancholy and we love the innocence of that. But there's something new, a new kind of innocence that the next generations have presented to us, right? Because their world, are, they're facing a bunch of different challenges that we, we didn't face. Mind you, the art form itself um, has been... Uh, uh, hello? Uh, the, the art itself, the art itself, uh, never remain static, right? And it's now finding it's, uh, now we're realizing that it's an application to the medium of a surface, any surface, give me a surface, whether it's a, it's a mug, it's a t-shirt, it's a hat, it's a dress, a sneaker, a train, a wall, a building, it go, and there it goes. So there, for me, there's no time to feel melancholy as much as it is to be um, uh, adventurous and fearless. The one moment I will say was melancholy, those of you who had followed me at the museum were the talks because I was afraid many of us would die. Um, uh, that was a reality. And yes, we did lose some practitioners in this culture and friends and family, but the, the fear is real. And this makes it more poignant that you do the research and you do this kind of investigation um, as to record history, uh, not from the vantage of just the old school, but the present school, uh, because we're all at risk. We're all at risk, not just from, uh, let's just say, the, the disease of COVID, so to speak, there's violence, but also we're at the risk of being lost historically uh, in terms of the, 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 the marketplace of art, let's just say, and the discussion of art in, in academia as well. So therein has to be a push um, for every nation, every city that has a history, a starting point. Everybody has a starting point. So you have to take it upon yourself to do the work which you're doing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's my- Yeah, sorry. 
I think this okay. uh, aspect of the end of life is uh, also very present here. It, it, this this middle, middle of life is kind of also when you start uh, possibly consider yeah. the youth and, and what's coming. And uh, there's a really a lot of an yeah. existential tone in this material. Look, we're still young. I'm 55 years old. I mean, I'm still young. So think about if you if you understand culture, especially in context of time, how fast, how rapid this culture uh, not just grew up, but continues to grow. Hello. Yes. Uh, I think we have. Are you getting me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think we have um, uh, passed a little bit of the time for for the Jacob uh, uh, subject, but I think it's all the same, you know, panel, and we uh, we can kind of uh, need to keep keep on going. Also, I don't know if you. Uh, Carlos, if you have something prepared or if you have some, because you are next on, on the, on the list to talk, you are uh, without microphone. Here we go. Okay. Um, you know, I had, I, I was, I was going to do kind of this kind of very in-depth look at, because we want to talk about museums, right, and institutions, right? And so, but I think it's important to put that, I, 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 with, with, I'll try to do it without images, right? Because I think it's, it's important that the idea of uh, institutionalization was something that was foreign to us as, as a culture, right? Because we institutionalization for us meant jail or welfare or the system that was in place for us, right? To, to institutionalize, for us to assimilate. And you have to keep in mind that this was, and I'm talking from a period from the, the, the 60s to about the 80s, right? And, and black and brown folks in New York. And so this idea of assimilating was kind of like the usual track, right? Go to school, uh, join the army, get a job, um, fall in line, so to speak. Um, with the graffiti culture, there, there early on, there, there was this moment where institutionalization meant something different, meaning a different kind of assimilation into an institution of culture. Right, and there was a question about that, right? Because it's it's come up before in time, even in in modern art with like Brassai and and uh, did a show years ago, Language of the Wall, many years ago. Um, which, in, interestingly enough, that title, Language of the Wall, came back up at a show that I was in at the Para Museum some years ago, uh, that featured artists like. Uh, Cope, KR, Futura, myself, and many others. But this idea that uh, an, a, a cultural institution would look at a kind of outsider form of art that was primitive um, was not a new idea. It, it, it was in, in, that con, in that contemporary language, but it just wasn't about us because we were we were vandalizing public space, the public space all around museums, actually. And so when in, an, in the early 70s, when writers first started kind of, um, you know, going to these vocational schools, art schools, let's just call them music and art, performing arts, uh, high school of art and design and so on. Um, there was this exposure to uh, European art, right? Uh, more so than indigenous art and, and art that was related to us as either Puerto Ricans, Haitians, Jamaicans and so on and Africans. And so the context in which many of these young writers who were in these schools, right, in terms of relating to art history is usually European history, uh, modernism, if anything else as well, because of Picasso's strong pull. Now, as a young kid in the South Bronx, we weren't looking at that per se. We were looking at comic books. We were looking at all the great 
Marvels and DC comic books. Some were looking at underground comic books. Uh, very few were referencing contemporary art per se. Uh, not that they were wholly ignorant of it, but by and large, they were, they're the community. Um, that said, what was really interesting for me was at a very young age, I established a relationship with museums uh, because I was escaping a very brutal life. So I was between a culture that was trying to see itself as creatives and artistic. And then there was this other place, a very sanctified space um, that was uh, felt off limits to us, which was the museums. Uh, and including the galleries. So early on, while the, the first generation of writers um, were exploring these spaces, right? Um, and, and you gotta give props to UGA um, and some of those pioneering artists of that generation who are being guided to paint on canvas, which is a formality of art making, so to speak. And then there's Noga, a uh, nation of graffiti artists where artists would go to paint on canvas so to understand the practice of, of painting contemporary work. Um, those guys had some inroads, but it ended up, it, it was too quick. It just kind of went, it was kind of not novel and no one took it seriously that then again, the work did not have the kind of um, gravitas it required uh, to be in those spaces because it was mostly writing and style writing. And, and, and if that's a very specific kind of, of, of art and scholarship. And it wasn't until the eighties uh, when you get non-subjective work like Futura 2000 who painted the, the brake train that really started pulling us closer to that conversation with they, a lot of people throughout Kandinsky and, and, and those guys, the, the Blue Rider group and stuff. But that, then you had uh, Lee who painted the Campbell's soup cans for Fred or with Fred. And uh, uh, that was another point towards that, right? So we started seeing all of a sudden in the eighties the reference to this contemporary work that existed only in museums and in books. And so for me, it was really interesting early on because you know, as a young writer, I wasn't aware of these things per se and what they meant because I spent time in museums between museums and layups and the South Bronx when my, my contemporaries didn't uh, in the same way that I did because I was escaping a very difficult life. And in fact, I, I went to school across uh, uh, two major important museums, the Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum. So that's where I spent a lot of time as a kid but with great deal of investigation as to, well, what is art and what is humanity through art and where are we in this conversation? We meaning black and brown people, but also graffiti writers and hip hop heads, right? And can we be in this conversation? And so, and it, it was in institutions that I started to kind of debate inside my head about this work, about our place and what's the function of an institution, right? Uh, and if that's the if the function of an institution is to serve the people, how is it serving the people? How is it serving me? And if if it's not serving me, how would I like to see it serve me? Um, that said, there was a moment of hope when um, the late Martin Wong uh, set up shop, uh, and on I think it was Bond Street. He started the first. Uh, quote unquote, Museum of Graffiti with his collection. And that was an eye opener because he understood, like I understood the value of scholarship and preservation. Uh, he was an older uh, artist, uh, but he had a love and understanding of the culture and also its importance and its potential importance in the future. So he collected a lot of work. Um, that said, that was also short lived. But what didn't die with that was that I had this very curious mind about institutions, if not art history. And so with art, you know, this, this idea of art history was already important to many of us writers because what people don't understand, a lot of these young writers who went to the bench, um, that was another form of education, 
right? You're, you're learning aesthetics, you're learning about writers, where they come from, who's who. Uh, I know Kelly and I were very curious in the beginning about who was doing what, who were the best writers. Uh, we were able to disseminate who were the best amongst the hand style writers, the throw up writers, the top to bottom writers, the, the wall style writers and so on. Um, and, you know, we had this active museum gallery, so to speak, that we, we paid attention, attention to every day and it was free. That said, you know, when, when I went into museums, it kind of, I, I kind of felt that same feeling, but I was alone. So I turned to books, right? And then I turned to debating it. And then I turned to somebody very important in my life, which you guys all know is Henry Chalfont. And Henry Chalfont in 1980 took me to the Picasso retrospective at MoMA. And that made a huge impact on me because all of a sudden I'm seeing something I never saw before. And that was parallels. Had parallels between a period of time in which some of these men lived and the time we lived in. A time of war, a time of innovation, a time of, of uh, you know, breaking paradigms. And it was there that I started to construct a deep conversation with Henry about uh, art history, about the culture of graffiti and art history uh, institutions. So him and I became very active museum goers over time. And we kept saying, well, why isn't there a museum for hip hop? Why is it? It's just culture and stuff like that. It was too controversial. Uh, um, and and it, it, it was one too controversial and perhaps we needed to understand, I needed to understand what the function of a museum was and how it, 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 it functions. And so I, I got very curious about this, these, these museums and over time and over the years, um, I spent a majority of my time in museums and galleries throughout the world, um, not learning about contemporary art and historical art, but also it, how do, how do what's the common practice? What's the practice here and who's it for? And so there was a lot to learn about um, uh, institutions and how they function, but how they're built, right? And how do we build a foundation for the future, right? Uh, and, and what's required, right? Because if you look at institutions and museums, how heavyweight they are, and they are endowed with a lot of money they're endowed with a lot of brain power and people armed with degrees. Uh, they're endowed with institution money and corporate money, uh, all this stuff because it requires a great deal of um, support from uh, in terms of having uh, acquisitions, in terms of preservation and research and curation and marketing and so on. It's enormous undertaking. It's crazy. That's the old model, right? And one of the things that we've learned about this culture is how nimble it is and how quickly it'll remix this, these concepts, right? Um, and and the, the market of art itself, uh, in terms of how we sell art and, and distribute art, but now how we preserve art, right? Because now all of a sudden the internet's come along and, you know, has made it, um, you know, it, how do I put it? Complete, COVID has taught us that it's still very possible to visit museums virtually and still get a satisfactory experience and education from it. Um, we program around that. And so what we're seeing that the, these kinds of spaces, I think what the Museum of Graffiti has done in terms of what it represents, it's, it's this kind of going back to this kind of, you know, piecing it together as best you can that's in hip hop, that's part of this, right? We, you know, that Ket had a vision and, and he had access and resources and then Allison had resources and, you know, it, you know, the idea came about to put it in a place where it would be um, appropriate, right? That it spoke to the community and served the community. Uh, if you think about where some of the museums are placed in your, in your communities, is it really there to serve that community or is it just great real estate, right? Now, great real estate matters because uh, 
if you don't own the ground you you stand on, you're you're going to lose it. And that's the peril of creating institutions now. You need a lot of money to own the ground you're on. Now, this particular museum here uh, is a response for me. And the reason I got involved was because it's a response to that history that I have of going into institutions and not seeing myself, but also, you know, going to these, these institutions and realizing they're, they're kind of hijacking our culture in a way, and you don't know this, but they're hijacking our culture to create programming, right? soft programming that goes to the kids in school, that goes, you know, to community centers and certain outreach. And, you know, they're saying they're serving, you know, the inner cities and so on. But the fact that it's not represented inside is another issue. Now, we've been seeing that shift over the last 15 years or so, 20 years. Um, more recently, you know, Jose Parla had a show, this Henry had a show. Uh, I've had, you know, there, there, there's no shortage of artists having exhibitions in museums, um, so to speak. So now it shows that, you know, that, that, that not just that the work is is at that level. Um, it's it's the it's the the critique. Not, it's the academic part of it that has reached that level already, and so the discourse isn't anymore just about the art. As I often say in, to people who come into the Museum of Graffiti, I say, look, this is, this is a story not about art so much as it is about children and how children who changed the world of art and the culture of art and created the world's largest art movement. Let me guide you through this story. And one of the things that I do that's interesting there from time to time, which you don't see in, in contemporary museums, big museums, is that you know, we, we, we guide you through this. We educate you through this whole process uh, very directly. And so what I've found was that not only that was that unusual for a museum, but also that we stud, we put a, a commercial gallery in a museum. Why would you do that? And of course, everybody kind of thumbs their nose at that, right? And we're like, look, we've got to serve our community. We've got to show our artists. We've, we've got to support them. We've got to create both a commercial and academic space for them, because by putting a commercial space in kind of a historical space, now you put the artists in context to the work that we're discussing, right? And so we've been showing a lot of the newer school guys with, in context to the old school guys. We even had Lady Pink actually work, one of the older artists there. Now, given that it's a small startup institution, um, the symbolism there is probably the most important part of that, right? It, it symbolizes that we will have to take this upon ourselves um, to see this through. Um, and that uh, it, it's, it's not an individual or not, it's not a huge endowment that will dictate what it is, that it was by consensus of the community by and large, right? And that's a hard thing, right? To have consensus, especially amongst the graffiti writing community as to what's important, what's not important. And we're just scratching the surface on that. And so this is why the symbolism is so important because if it's not, it's not just for, for the fact that we could do it, it's if we don't do it, who's gonna do it? And, and well, who's gonna, who's gonna, inspire the next generation of, of advocates, curators, writers um, that will push this forward? Will it be outside money? Will it be somebody like the man who, who opened up urban Berlin, right? Somebody on the outside who loves it and so on. And that's usually the case. But here, what I hope um, and, I, and I think, as I think about museums and my experience with museums um, and this, 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 this uh, the culture of art, it's, it's kind of really convoluted right now because it's, it's museums have become very commercial spaces, so to speak, to survive. Um, and so it relies on, on programming to become relevant, right? If you have good programming, you start 
you, you know, historically, those museums of great programming always have good members, uh, memberships, and so on and so forth. But what I think what's somewhat disappointing, what I see is because membership drives and supports bigger institutions, is that the graffiti museum, the graffiti museum doesn't, it really hasn't had a huge uptick in membership from its own community. And it says something very interesting about what they may not, what we may not be saying or what they may not understand about what a museum means, what an institution can mean to the culture moving forward. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, Carlos, that, that's it. Uh, just, I, I, let me just close. Yeah. 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 Just saying that I'm, uh, we are short on time and already crossing yeah. here. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, well, I, this, I was going to close out with this that the the one thing you know absent a physical museum right that i say is really super fantastic is that we have platforms like this uh, digital platforms that will uh, live for a very long time but also that instagram um uh, and many of the those that post historical stuff from around the world are creating this virtual archive that's available. Now, how does that get managed and condensed into one space for people to try to understand? I, I think we should give up on trying to understand this as a whole. I think it, it's, it just grows in, in different spaces, but there is a starting point, which we discussed earlier, right? Which is the, that romantic space, the melancholy space, uh, that exists for all of us, whether it was 1970 in New York or 1983 in London or, or wherever, that's where that starts. Uh, it's still very young, so there's a great deal of potential in us, for us rather, in, in existing in two spaces at the same time. Yeah. Meaning virtual and well, physical. It's yeah it's it's a uh, it's a big big challenge you have there uh, uh, i don't want to talk about my challenges but i have my challenge of managing time here and also i have another challenge that is to uh, after this um, uh, impressive uh, statement you made um, to also include todd and mural art program from philadelphia in our panel so we have, a, I think, uh, I was asking Todd if he knew you and the project of Graffiti Museum. I, I think you don't know each other. So I think for me, it's an honor uh, to put you guys in contact as it was for uh, many others in the past. And uh, so I will welcome Todd and his presentation and Carlos, of course, uh, you'll be around and we can continue to talk. So uh, I don't know if, is there any fast question to Carlos at this point, but needs to be fast because I don't want to consume Todd time. I don't know if he has compromises after. No one for Carlos, the fast one? No, okay, so not Todd. A, not the fast one, but perhaps we could take him afterwards. Uh, uh, so we can have yeah yeah we can continue together. i just want and then to anybody who has i don't to know go. i don't know if i don't know if todd mm -hmm. yeah exactly i don't know how he's about time yeah please todd okay well i hope i hope to be 15 minutes or less <laughs> first of all pedro thank you so much i'm so happy to be here after so many years of trying I, I i do appreciate your invitation and uh, Carlos, what a, a nice opportunity to hear from you and, and meet you this way. Um, I, I, I was enthralled by what you had to say, and I know there's a lot more to talk about. So, Pedro, you accomplished your goal. <laughs> um, um, I, 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 my conversation is going to be very different from what you just heard. First of all, um, I'm Todd Bressy, I'm in Philadelphia, and I work at Mural Arts Philadelphia. So, first of all, I work in an institution. Uh, you might say. Um, second of all, um, we focus on what we call here public art, not so much street art or graffiti. So it's a very different context in which I work, but we, we work with artists of all stripes. And third, I'm not an academic, at least not today. I'm, I'm a reporter. Uh, fourth, um, I, I have 
um, loved these conversations about uh, about life, about about reflection on one's work, about valuing one's work over time, about placing it in other contexts. It's a very generational kind of time context. When I saw that the theme of this presentation would be time, I decided I'm gonna talk about 2020. So I'm gonna talk about a very compressed period of time, a very opposite period of time um, than the other two uh, speakers did, but maybe we'll, we'll get to some of the same themes anyway. Um, a word of introduction, and I will try to uh, share my screen now. Um, Mural Arts Philadelphia is an institution. We are approaching our uh, 40th uh, anniversary of operations in the city of Philadelphia. Does that work now? Yes, it's working. Okay, great. Uh, we are uh, not only an institution, but we are partly an institution of city government. Uh, part of our funding comes from the city of Philadelphia and part of it comes from private philanthropy. Very unusual kind of institution. Um, we are, uh, our motto, our slogan, our vision up until last year was Art Ignites Change because we're very uh, focused on uh, promoting work that looks at how art and artists can, can help propel um, social economic uh, justice in cities. Last year, we realized that change was igniting art. The change was in front of us, and that was beginning to um, lead us in our path. And so what I'd like to do is kind of chronologically go through what last year looked like for us and, and how, how, how we responded to a context which was really a public health context, a racial justice, justice context, a, de a democratic democratic participation um, context um, and, and a, a context in which artists were, were struggling to survive. Um, so we are known mostly for doing murals like this. Um, um, we are known for creating these indelible marks on the city of Philadelphia with artists of all sorts. If you recognize this painting on the right, the style at least, it's by Amy Sherald who painted Michelle Obama's portrait. Um, and people, um, you know, as, when we were talking about time a little earlier, I was thinking about how these, mar these murals create an indelible landscape, a geography, memory for people in the city as well. This is by Espo, uh, who does a couple of pieces with us every year um, um, in different parts of Philadelphia. Um, but we're not just about what goes on the wall. We work very intensely with um, all sorts of um, people in the city. And our three key focal, three of our key focuses are on restorative justice. That's working with people who um, either directly have been involved with the uh, criminal justice system or in families or neighborhoods that are impacted by the criminal justice system. These two men uh, were, um, 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 people who had been incarcerated and are now um, actively working with mural arts. We work with youth all over the city through um, the, uh, uh, structure and informal art education programs. Uh, we also work, this is from our, we call it Porchlight, but it's a, a, a program that focuses on behavioral health, mental health, uh, people who are struggling with addiction, people who are at risk of suicide, people who are really um, struggling to navigate uh, through life. And so we have our programs. Um, and all of these programs, which I just described, are funded by city government. They're funded by philanthropies. They're funded by private donors. And so we take that mix of money to do projects. And we've been working in that way for many, many years until last year. Um, and so um, last year, we uh, while we approached the year as we would any other, getting ready to go out in the streets in the spring and start painting a whole new, uh, whole new round of murals, um, the, the COVID epidemic broke. And uh, March 10th is when it arrived in Philadelphia, as, at least in terms of formal recording of it. Um, and that, that changed our course. Whoops. A week later, uh, we were all ordered to stay home. Um, and at that point, it kind of became clear that we would not be able to operate in the way we normally do. We would not be able to meet with people. We would not be able to meet with the communities or the 
uh, folks who depended on mural arts as service. We would not be able to go out and paint. Uh, in fact, everything that we did would have to be rethought because of the orders to stay home. One of our first uh, thoughts was how do we keep interacting with the people who are our communities that we work with, the youth uh, in particular, the people who come to our neighborhood-based studios where they connect with social service and mental health professionals. How do we, how do we keep that alive? How do we, how do we help uh, take care of those people? And how do we actually um, um, uh, provide information to them about what is happening to them and how they can contextualize what's going on? Uh, within, within about two weeks of um, being ordered to stay home, we had rethought our art education program so it could operate online. Um, and so over the course of the year, we put together 40 uh, curricula that kids could access to uh, follow through the things that they had been working on in, in our art programs. And now uh, there were other people, not us, in the city working on issues of digital divide. Our cable company in the city began to provide a free internet service and places where people could access computers to hook up. Um, we, we worked on the content side. I put this slide into last minute when we were when there was conversations about I think Carlos was talking about digital technology and how it's being used to record. Uh, we went at we realized that people if they could not go around the city, they could not see the murals they loved. And so we began to create uh, videos uh, filmed by drones uh, and putting them up on our web page to come and creating mural tours by drone, essentially, so people could continue to see the work they loved. By the beginning of April, the public health response began to be clear. And if you recall those days, the first thing that uh, people began talking about was hand washing. And so uh, because of our work with the city's Department of Health, um, we were part of the public service campaign to help encourage people to do hand washing and ultimately other things. And so we, we switched into public service gear. Um, and what was interesting about this and many of the things we did is by doing these kinds of graphic public service announcements, we were able to tap into a much broader range of artists who might not have had experience doing big murals on walls, but had worked at smaller scales, had worked in different ways and could easily, um, could easily put together a small project like that. Uh, social distancing, another key public health um, step um, that, that was rolled out early on. Uh, we commissioned um, small designs from artists, again, public service type announcements, and um, began to deploy them throughout the city. More than 5,000 of these were located in, in, uh, in, office, in government office buildings where people had to go, supermarkets, places where people still needed to go to remind them of, um, of, of what social distancing meant, actually, and how it worked, and uh, uh, what, was, what, was, what was expected of them. A month or six weeks into the, a month or five weeks into the um, crisis, we had our first peak of COVID cases. So all this happened very rapidly. Um, we worked through our community networks, through our neighborhood-based studios um, to focus on the production of masks. Now we didn't uh, ask people to come to places and produce masks. We, we provided kits that people could pick up and drop off uh, sort of uh, remote type, uh, remote type piecework that people could do. Um, to help to help to help create masks for themselves and for their neighbors. So that was a very uh, do-it-yourself type effort. About two months into the crisis, we began uh, uh, to start to observe what we were doing. It, it took that long two two months of before we could really start saying, "So, what are we actually doing here? What's going on?" Um, uh, what does this mean for us, for the city, for artists? And we we launched two podcast series that 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 occurred just about every week. Uh, one, uh, Art Ignites Change, was um, focused more on um, artists uh, who were um, asked to talk about their their trajectories and how their trajectories were being impacted uh, by what was happening. And then I organize this art in action, which was really about how does mural arts, um, how does mural arts um, adapt its work 
in this time. And we talked, we, we had uh, six topics. Uh, the first rapid response really just talked about the projects I described. We had this topic, uh, personal health, um, excuse me, about getting about how people connect when they are remote. And it really talked about the psychological impacts of being together and being apart and being on Zoom. Um, and about midway through this series, um, I'm sorry, um, that's May 6th, you see, Memorial Day was the weekend when George Floyd was murdered. And we did a whole nother 180 on this series and everything else. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. This was actually, I think, the last one we had uh, before he was murdered. Um, as the city emptied out, um, shop owners, even before George Floyd and the racial justice protests, uh, uh, store owners began to board up their, their windows. They had to close, no one was downtown, and for safety reasons, they just started putting up barriers, blocking their windows, and, and, and the center of the city was like a ghost town. So um, we worked with um, the city again to start to at least do something so that those didn't quite uh, look as forlorn as they might have. And so we, we deployed dozens of these. Um, these are printed murals that, that could be stuck up on the walls that were going up around the city. Uh, we also created a series of what were called um, hope medallions. And this project was initiated by an artist. And that's one of the things about mural arts that's always interesting to me is that even though we are a rather big institution, um, we're very open to and often incorporate ideas that just come up from individual artists. And this was one artist who, who used this kind of visual approach to do a series about environmental issues and switched it, her, her, her subject matter came to us with a proposal and we found funding for her to produce these that she could put on buildings around the city. And it was Memorial Day then that the second big uh, event of, of 2020 um, occurred. Um, the murder of George Floyd and the protests around the country and certainly the protests in, in Philadelphia. And I think uh, by this time we knew with COVID and with this that these were not new things. These were really, these were really uh, un lying to bear cracks which already occurred, which already existed in our society uh, and laid them at our feet for us to deal with. Um, in the city, um, one of the first things that happened was uh, this is a mural that Mural Arts did a very long time ago of a, of a, of a, um, of a former mayor and former police chief who um, was um, very racist and also homophobic and was um, uh, known to endorse practices of violence against both, both groups of people. Um, the mural was, was painted at a different time and sponsored by people who, for whom his Italian heritage was a matter of pride and was always a source of contention. Uh, so it began to be vandalized, as you see at the top, and the cops sent out somebody to protect the mural. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we decided after protests mounted that it was time for the mural uh, to be to be removed uh, because the while some people um, felt his legacy was important to them, for far more people it created uh, reminded them of a legacy of of pain and abuse at the hands of city government. Um, we also began to think about whether, as every arts organization did. Uh, last year, were we really doing enough uh, in terms of our, our support of the black and brown uh, communities uh, um, and others? And we launched what was called the Philadelphia Fellowship for Black Artists. And that really was simply no strings attached stipends uh, for, for artists. It was competitive. Um, we, put, we found uh, curators uh, uh, from the black community. Um, and who helped us uh, review portfolios. And what was interesting about this is it, it began to, uh, amazingly, for an, or, for an organization that had been working in the city for 35, 40 years, it connected us with a whole new group of artists who really hadn't been on our horizon, who painted in different kinds of styles and worked with different kinds of issues. And really it widened our ability to connect, to connect with artists. And as they are now fellows, we can, we can help bring them into other kinds of projects and connect them with other resources to move forward. 
We also realized that messaging about public health um, was not something that only uh, that, that we needed diverse voices in helping us do that. Uh, and so our restorative justice program um, worked with uh, uh, formerly incarcerated people to create a special series of, um, of um, uh, public service announcements uh, uh, from the Black community about not just public health, but, but about um, uh, coming together in, in times when um, the racial justice uh, protests were, were going on. And these were not just posters, but they, they, they were, there were uh, rap, rap productions, uh, spoken word productions, a whole range of, of projects that artists were paid to do to, to help, um, to help um, you know, build a campaign of conversation and awareness. On the other side of the coin, um, we um, uh, commissioned a citywide mural um, that was created through Instagram uploads um, through a, a new kind of technology that allows uh, artists to uh, assemble assemble uh, Instagram images as pixels into the composition of a larger mural. Uh, and this project was seen to be uh, as a project of hope for a city that was that was reeling from the from these twin crises. Uh, by the time of the summer, uh, even though we were being told to stay home and stay apart, the city being what it is, people needed to get outside. Um, and so we worked uh, with the Parks Department to create uh, a series of tools that could be used um, for communities that didn't have good access to parks, open space recreation, uh, to turn their streets into socially distanced gathering spaces. And so we created a mobile art studio and supplies that we could uh, take around the city for people to close down their blocks and, and, um, um, and be outside during the summer. Uh, again, in the spirit of making the murals uh, more uh, accessible to people, we, we began to um, upload um, uh, digital tours people could take since they were not getting around the city. Again, they could, they could visit the murals I like the best. By the fall, um, you know, four or five months into the crisis, we were able to um, begin to uh, produce works, serious works that um, reflected this, this pivot. Um, fortunately, because we have uh, a strong restorative justice program and funding and a pipeline of artists who work in, 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 in that program, um, we were able to move quickly to commission some, some, some and, and to complete things that had already been in the pipeline. Uh, probably one of the most significant pieces we completed uh, last year uh, was uh, a piece that had been in the works, but was re reoriented to, um, to look at, um, to look at um, uh, uh, protests for racial justice and action uh, for racial justice. So, this artist Russell Craig, who was formerly uh, formerly incarcerated, created a mural in which he composed imagery of um, uh, compiled from Black Lives Matter protest and listed the names of uh, Black people who had been uh, killed killed by the police. Uh, later that year, in, uh, he in November completed this, which was a tribute to Black women who led voting rights movements uh, around the country, and then. Um, last year, or excuse me, this year, it, on the first anniversary of George Floyd's uh, murder, um, uh, produced, produced a piece um, that features um, the theme of Black people, people who are in the leadership of Black wellness, the Black wellness movement. In the fall, we began to pivot to the third crisis, uh, which was our election. Um, and, and the feeling among many that our, our, our our democratic future was on the line. And so uh, we undertook a couple of projects to help educate people about their right to vote, the importance of voting, um, so that, so that we had uh, early voting in Pennsylvania so we could connect people with the resources they needed, they needed to vote. Also in the fall, as masking um, became clear, it became clear that masking was one of the most um, effective ways of, of, of slowing transmission of COVID. Uh, we, we began to install masks uh, on our murals um, to, 
to remind people of the importance of this. And um, as, as we know, different communities receive information and process information and value information about these public health measures differently. And so we hoped that by uh, doing this in communities throughout the city, that we would create more confidence in people that masking was truly an important thing for them to do. Other programs we had that are not as focused on those particular crises also had to pivot. Uh, we have an environmental justice program, uh, which has been focused uh, a lot on, on plastics and the impact of plastics. And so, um, because that, 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 uh, that program um, couldn't organize in the way that it traditionally did, it shifted to a public service mode. And so it appropriated uh, the language of advertising um, to and, and worked with artists to develop ways of getting words out, the word out about its, its work. Uh, so a series of billboards and then a series of um, um, uh, posters uh, that people could, could order, they could download and, and install in their own in their own community. So that ex an exploration of changing from the mode of muralism to the mode of, 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 of um, advertising and posters, uh, which I think we've found throughout our programs, we've seen more and more of. Um, the end of the year um, closed out with a, uh, a very important uh, exhibition uh, at the African American Museum of Philadelphia about, about, about the inequities in the justice system. And it was curated by our mural arts restorative justice curator um, who assembled a series of artists who had been incarcerated to develop pieces um, that, um, that reflected on their experiences and the different, uh, different aspects of injustices in the criminal justice system. Most, many of the, some of the projects, for example, focused on on the objectification of the male body of the black male body and the way that that it is that it is viewed in the world. Particularly important to Philadelphia, artist Titus Kafar, who has who, whose work revolves uh, some of his work revolves around redaction, uh, developed a, a asked um, inmates to look at the Declaration of Independence and um, redact it in a way that uh, made it speak to what they thought the truth of our country was. And this was part of the exhibition, but it will be translated into a mural uh, that will be um, uh, put up in the center of the city. Uh, this mural was created during the time of the exhibition. Um, it is made by, it is, it's actually made out of leather satchels. It's materials collected um, from, from inmates and it has images of inmates on it. And um, it is, um, it is meant because it is so tactile to kind of help reflect on the brutality of, of, of prison life. Um, we did a second round of voting projects in, in closer to the election, simply to encourage people to vote on election day. And the election itself, um, um, November 3rd, and then um, the day that um, um, the election uh, was was called for Biden seemed to be, in a certain way, uh, the end of the year and the launching of of what we're facing now. We did do a couple of other uh, important mural. We did paint last year, even though it was very difficult. Um, uh, a couple of uh, major pieces throughout the city. We tried to keep that work up, though it was very slow. So where we are now, 2021, uh, much of that work continues. We are. Uh, out painting in the city this summer, um, but uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, a lot has been stirred up in Philadelphia. Just last week, uh, a mural that was a tribute to George Floyd uh, was vandalized by white supremacists. This was the picture that was in the paper, and so these very violent actions continue in our city. On the other hand, uh, we are getting ready to reconvene in one of our uh, greatest civic spaces in front of our art museum where every summer, this is sort of turned into, it's a parking lot, but it's turned into, into sort of a, a common ground uh, where people can, can come and play games and, and, and relax in the park. And so this year's theme, which is a mural we paint every year on the surface is 
together again because we're just happy that we can that we can do that. So um, that's a quick scan of what we uh, of what happened to us last year. And I think that um, two of the um, key lessons um, that we or, or two of the things I just sort of like points I'd like to make in conclusion are that um, much of the art you saw again I said at the beginning it's not graffiti art but it's by it's art by people who have been excluded um, from the normal processes of expressing themselves whether they're incarcerated, whether they don't have access to the resources, whether they've not been valued in the world and therefore not listened to. And so a lot of our work revolves around, uh, um, uh, revolves around uh, uh, elevating, elevating, elevating those voices. Um, and the second um, observation is, is that um, the, the crises that we faced, although I said they were not ultimately things that were new in our world. They simply re revealed cracks in our society that we preferred not to pay attention to. Um, we're able to produce powerful art. And when we let what is happening in the city drive what we do, when we let the passions and, 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 and the protests of the people uh, drive what we do, uh, we, can, we, can create, we can create powerful work. So I will, I will stop there. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, it was great, about, great having this. That was great, really terrific. Great having this recorded and uh, it's very good. Uh, Carlos, you for sure knew the Mural Arts Program, right? Yeah, I, I you know, Todd, I, I was fortunate enough to I recent, well, what, about last a year, more than a year ago, I was invited over to the Barnes Foundation uh, to give a talk uh, where I met Cornbread and I was there with Prince Ken Swift, a legendary boy. We were out there, uh, Jaime uh, Merwin, who does some of the programming there invited us. But I also got a chance to kind of um, understand Philadelphia a bit more uh, historically. And, and um, I mean, it's, it's a tremendous story there, but also the, in the, the mural arts program in terms of over the years, what you guys have been able to accomplish, which is quite phenomenal. One of the things that was really interesting to me was that a city that is so polarized historically, right? It's, it's like, you know, the arts has to, we have to get in bed with these very strange bedfellows, even with our oppressors, right? And so that's a very interesting space to navigate, um, especially um, in the arts, right? When we, on the one hand, the city doesn't care much for the arts, they don't budget for it, but I know that sometimes these are kind of what we call soft diplomacy issues, right? So Todd, in terms of, uh, of navigating that, right? In a city that historically has not been very kind to Blacks and the Black community. I like that you're doing more programming around them and awareness of the Black artists, because generally, to be very honest, these mural arts programs are so uh, white-centric, right? And we, we see that, it, I see that through, you know, through my journeys and stuff like that. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, perhaps. Uh, so to speak, uh, uh, but also that uh, usually these kinds of programs that are brought to the fore by ethnic people don't usually get through the door and the sponsorship required. But you manage to really like uh, diversify it and, and find a, recontextualize it on the fly over the years, which is great, which is really important. Um, and then that, that now you arrive at the true identity of your city, right? Um, because of the last year um, and, and negotiating for moving forward, right? How much is the ask, how much is this, uh, again, because you're, you're asking of, of corporate sponsors and the city and stuff like that, but then what's the ask of the community? Is, is the community giving back or are they just receiving um, at this point? Um. Well, so, so first of all, we work in so many different ways. I, I don't want to pretend there's one general answer that I can give, right? Um, and also, I think that depending on what the situation is, the community can be defined differently, right? 
But at the risk of sounding facile, let me give you a couple examples because we don't have a lot of time. Um, the the trash, the I showed you some public service announcements about plastic, right? And you might think, I might think, oh, that's a white person's issue. Let's get rid of plastic bags. Um, but a couple of years ago, um, the people who run that program wanted to develop a new citywide environmental campaign, and they they decided to use South Philadelphia as as the um, starting point where they'd begin their investigation. And they spent about nine months in an artist-led process just to find out what was most important to people. Like if what were the people in South Philly, what was their concern about, about the, the, the physical, the, the environment around them? And out of that um, came the idea that what people cared about was trash. They, they did not like the trash on their streets. They did not like the illegal dumping that was going on uh, in the lots in their neighborhood because it came from all over the place. The trash is what their priority was. And so that's why we created that whole initiative. So there the ask was, what matters to you? And through a process, we're able to discern that and then develop responses. Um, I think the restorative justice program is another good example because it's it's led by people who are, you know, have been adjudicated by the criminal justice system. It builds on their experiences and they determine where it goes. Um, and so that's a narrower community, right? But but that community of people and, and their families and their neighborhoods, they set the agenda for the projects that happen um, that show uh, that I mentioned at the African American um, Museum in Philadelphia, the curator is a, uh, a person who was uh, committed of, convicted of felonies for drug crimes, got involved with mural arts while he was in prison, became an assistant artist when he graduated, developed his own practice, and now curates things. So I, I kind of feel like they, the, the folks for whom that is their experience, they drive, yeah. they drive what happens. Excuse me for a second, please. Sorry, <laughs> my son's okay. Um, so those are a couple of examples, Carlos. I mean, I won't say mural arts is perfect, and but I think that that ethic is that when when we can, we recognize that what we have to do is use our resources to discern what what it is in the communities we're working with that's important, and then build our work around that. Susan from London. Susan from London. Hi, Carlos from Miami. I'm just wondering, to what extent have you had to move to like a hybrid or digital model, given these crazy times? Like, are you surviving on your original plan or how much do you have to like adapt right now? Well, it, well, just like Todd, we had to kind of diversify our approach during COVID uh, and BLM and we responded. Uh, we programmed and we continued to program on and offline regardless. We kept our doors open as long as we could, uh, but we started thinking broader about our role and our role in this community, a community that's changing, right? Because, you know, keep in mind, you know, there's, there's, an inherent, there's something inherently fucked up about all of this, right? In terms of murals and, and, and murals in communities, right? Because it ties back it, with all intentions being in, in the right place most of the time, that it ties back to dealing with real estate and real estate value and creating value in a community that you don't own, right? And therein lies the tragedy of, of all of this, right? And that what we learned during COVID was that not only were we doing and responding to the moment, but the response, the, the moment was responding to us as well because there was, there's so much, uh, development going on all around us that's put all this stuff at stake, right? And because that community, there's no, that uh, that transient artist community uh, created this space more or less is no longer there. What we know of Wynwood will ultimately be Wynwood Walls or in you know, the museum itself. Uh, 
if there was a tighter community, so to speak, like Philadelphia, Brooklyn, um, and others maybe where you are, um, there, you, you know, you have more of an impact on your community. And so the way we have community is in a very different manner. Um, you know, it's very niche in what we serve, not where, whereas where Todd is serving an actual community, you're in the thick of it. Uh, this community had, has had its moment and um, we're just uh, riding it out to see where it goes. It's gonna go far is what I was trying to say, but I'm on mute because I've got like 12 people in my yeah. house now, okay. God. <laughs> yeah, but again, you, one has to be reminded that the work that you are all doing, that they're models, right? You guys have been refining models uh, for the next generation. And we're not gonna get it perfect. We'll get it close to where it needs to be. Uh, but you guys are modeling for the next generation. Um, and what's important about this is that um, we lucked out because uh, we have a more uh, visually literate society than before. And so that's where all this comes in. That's where you're able to grab people who are not, who may live in the projects who have no idea about art and artists until you know, this kind of movement comes into place, right? And starts to educate them and intrigue them. Um, so therein lies the purpose of your work. You're on mute. I'm on mute, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Carlos. Oh my God, look at Jakob. Are you in a park, Jakob? <laughs> Susan is already in party mode. I'm, so. I'm, I'm I'm not smoking my dog, but I also have a question to, to Carlos a little bit about the museum, but uh, I can take it later. So. Yeah. So, um, well, I think, I think it's a great uh, moment to, <laughs> people's lives are getting on. And I think it's a great moment, it was a great moment. I hope that uh, uh, we all learned and to get more acquainted and, um, had opportunity to, to learn. Um, Carlos, Todd, uh, also, also Malcolm, I don't know if you are still around, but or walking your dog. Uh, but uh, I thank you all for being there. Um, I hope that um, you both in America can navigate the American issues. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, we we will deal with our problems here also all together. Yeah. Too. Have Carlos at the real conference in Lisbon next year. Can we please? Can we get you to Lisbon? Yes. Can we like? Yes. Can we like I, 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 I've 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 been to Lisbon. Yes, yes, for Lisbon. sure. I want, but I want us all to go to Lisbon at one time. This is not fun. Yeah. I hate but to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I share something with you guys? And, uh -huh. and you know, again, it, just to give this a little bit of. Um, perspective is that you know given given what I've learned and come up with through this culture not just this culture I think American culture in general in fact world culture in fact graffiti gave me world culture graffiti was my escape into the world as just as museums were and that the potential the in, infinite potential in humans in creative space is 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 truly defined by um, what history they anchored themselves to, right? What legacy we're anchored to. Uh, you pick and choose your ethnicity, you usually anchor yourself towards that. Um, in this culture, it's music, art, and dance, and, and all of that. Um, the, the, the muralist movement, uh, contemporary movement, doesn't connect itself to the great muralists like they used to, like the, the Orozco's and uh, Diego Rivera and all those great guys. It's a different generation but that there's a new legacy being created by your generation that, that we didn't really quite anticipate uh, that it would have this kind of um, one uh, 
just kind of a practical influence of copycatting throughout the world, but also then the creative process, then the actual living process, right? Because we are, we're, we're, it's not just about an act, an action, it's a response to a societal structure that kids are generally not, not, not happy with. Uh, but that to, to see it come this far, um, particularly in the realm of academic uh, investigation is really impressive to me because I always thought there were many angles to have this conversation and there's still plenty that have not really been discussed and investigated. Um, but what I'm thrilled about is the, it is that that it's happening in this in, in this kinds of spaces and virtual spaces and academia. Uh, a, 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 a lot of people I always hear a little bit of belly aching from folks about that the culture is dead it's not growing or this and that and they're unaware of this space of the community activation and the academic space that has been going on for a very yeah. long time and i've been a proponent of that from day one and to see it at this level to see and meet you all that are doing a variety of works it leaves me really optimistic uh, uh and and not so much um uh, you know, romantic. Nostalgic. The, right. Yeah. I'm enthusiastic about the future because the future has uh, has has another way of, of of you know recording the past, so to speak. And while you have us here, uh, us elders, to talk about it, yes, we can give you insight. But then that insight lasts up to a certain point, and then the next generation has their era, then on and on. And they too need to be investigated as I've been and continue to be investigated. But the other thing is that I'm so, I always say this, this is one of my quotes, you know, that, that I say all the time, you know, the beauty of art history is that it's always being corrected. And so we have to see this as something elastic, right? And malleable. And because there are so many stories in art and, and only, only few get elevated. Um, so imagine how that paradigm existed and worked in the favor of artists before, notably white men in art, right? And European art in that manner. But now you have somebody like Todd that's elevating the importance of art in a whole community, right? The community that rises up. Yeah, uh, the thing of making it operational it's very relevant right not only because usually academic academia it's uh it, it closes itself and that's a big danger of academia and right. the, the fact that being in contact with operational and very historical and institutional uh you know vaccinated in terms of institutional practice because mu yeah. mural mural arts program it's quite vaccinated throughout many cycles of life right uh, todd is is not uh, since the beginning i think is only for 15 years or something yeah. but uh but anyway it's a long history of institutional relation with with this subject and i think the, the maturity of the subject and the maturity of the the fauna and the ecosystem that is generated here um it it only it it, it will only improve i think so i will yeah. and, and and i have to add, and i'll add this is that it's it's in a way at a certain point it has to stop just reflecting on itself yeah it needs and, to operate and, and operate. that's yeah. That's a that's a that's a position I've always held about this culture that it's it's too self-referential, and if if you look at my works historically, and given what I was telling you about my relationship with museums, you'll see that I am my work, my graffiti work, my b-boy work. That's all in a conversation with art history because that's the conversation. That's that's what's kind of affirming these grand ideas that our generation had. It's just that the previous generation had the academic uh, uh, savvy to, and, and also the people who were supporting that to elevate that into the consciousness of the, of, of the market and the value and people who think of value per se, right? And that's an important thing. And that's why I say, when you, when you say that, for instance, 
uh, like I was referencing Andy Warhol and Kandinsky before, like when you start putting that kind of language in context to this culture, then all of a sudden, or, or, or Diego Rivera to the muralist, all of a sudden there's a point of historical reference that validates it, that creates a kind of conversation and context that's important for us, that, that shows our ideas, how ever naive or intuitive they were, they're aligned with a greater intelligence of art making and awareness that has been a continuum of time. And I, I, I'll, I'll share this with you really quickly because I've, I've done this talk for many years and ultimately did it in Russia. And it was a really simple question. Did hip hop have, did Russia have hip hop before us? And so that hypothesis, right? It's outlandish, it's scandalous to some, and, and, and then I had to prove that point. Right, but I can only prove that point by going back to those points in history where it made sense, where you there's evidence, right, and the evidence is there. So you could only imagine the kind of debates that that would have, uh, both here and in Russia. But it was important because it shows that this kind of activity that we're interested in isn't just like something that was created like in Philadelphia in the late '60s or New York. No, this is a continuum of stuff that's been going on uh, yeah. since the turn of the century. Uh, so yeah. in, in that sense, or, that's or, even, I feel, or even later. Huh? Or even later, yeah. Uh, but again, that, that part of later, right, is, is, is a bit of a stretch, right? Uh, it, and not, not a bit of a stretch, because it's obviously a connecting tendon to all of this. But that if, if we were to think of uh, of this particular culture, of the writing culture as we know it, uh, the graffiti culture. This is why I point to. I'll just leave it at this. Just look up, uh, look up uh, the Agit Prop movement and those guys who painted trains, top to bottom with characters and letters. Uh, I mean, look up the Kazakh dance who dance the Russians who dance like b boys. It, there's all kinds of references there. And I think that makes us all the better. And what we're seeing now, as we look at contemporary graffiti art moving into the next century, uh, and Jacob, you were there with me when I, in, in Sweden, when I gave the talk, Art for the Next Century. Um, I, I truly believe in the work that we're looking at at the moment, particularly coming out of young people uh, and young, those that have been influenced and moved by what we started, um, that, it won't be a surprise. I, I probably won't see it in my lifetime, the impact of, I mean, I'm seeing it now, the impact of my generation and generations prior, but we'll see the impact of this uh, maybe two generations from now, if not sooner, because the generations before Picasso and all those guys, they didn't have this thing called the internet. You know, they didn't have this kind of community, virtual community that was able to reach out around the world with a common interest. There was a different labor involved in getting to really uh, be engaged with those Parisian artists of that time. And now you could easily access me, part, any of the OGs uh, or, you know, uh, and, and you guys. Yeah. So it is a phenomenal time, I think. Uh, and in and, and, and many ways, uh, like I said, for me, if there's anything romantic about all this is to have enough foresight to, to um, look back far enough to know like where we came from and where we are today. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying hi to Susan Friend. Um, so I think we are, we, are, we are all set for next year. So uh, please feel yourself invited to Lisbon one year from now. And uh, I will keep in, yeah. in touch. I, I, I've been, I've been, I went, I've been to, to Qashqai, Alentej. I, 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 I fell in love with yeah, your Yeah, let's go. Let's I'm go. in the wrong let's country, come. by the way. No, you are, you are in a continent. <laughs> I'm in the wrong continent, let's just say. Uh -huh. But th thank you all for your time. I thank you. I thank you, Carlos, Todd. Thank you again. Susan, Jacob, Tom. Isabel, you are there. Victoria, Julie, Anna. I miss Esther, everybody. Chris. Can we all like Bye. be the 
same place soon. This is fucking rubbish. I love you. I love you, Pedro. For One year from now. Oh, Next can time. we go to Lisbon? Can we please like just be in Lisbon? I want to go to a bar now. Be. Rubbish. Me too. Yes. Be well. Be well of your arm. Ciao, ciao, Susan. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Everyone. <laughs> ciao, ciao, everyone. Ciao, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Stay well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Stay well. Bye bye.